You know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there is no group that has your best interest more in mind, you know, if you're a Canadian, than the Parliamentary Budget Office. And that's why I'm so pleased that Yves Giroux has joined me today. Yves, thank you for finding time. Obviously, I know you're busy. I mean, there's so much to keep track of, the size of the spending we've got in the government and that kind of thing. I I will start with a little bit of a pedestrian question, but then I'm hopping in with both feet. Uh, The pedestrian question is, What's your job? What's your role? I meant the Parliamentary Budget Office. You're the head of it, of course. But what, what's your mandate? And that's a, a very good question, not pedestrian at all. So our mandate is to provide unbiased, nonpartisan information and analysis to parliamentarians. So that's MPs and senators on the state of the economy, the state of the nation's finances, the cost of proposals that are before Parliament, or the cost of proposals that the government is is planning on, on making. So, for example, when we have a budget, there's very often like a series of proposals in the budget. Sometimes the costing is very thorough. Sometimes it's more, it's uh, not as thorough as one would wish. So that's one example of where we come in. So that's that's our mandate in a nutshell unbiased, nonpartisan information and analysis to parliamentarians, regardless of their political affiliation. I want to come to a statement you made on February 8th, I think, or maybe it was just reported on the 8th and you made it the day before, but you said the federal government is broken and bungles basic tasks with little cabinet scrutiny. Um, I, I'd love you to just to elaborate to what leads you to say, I mean, by the way, I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I read way too many of your reports, the Auditor General's reports, you know, some of the spending thing and, that, you know, uh, money unaccounted for, for example, and uh, it, the list goes on. But why do you say the federal government is broken in these ways? Well, I, I think I probably misspoke. I should probably not have said what I said, but I was testifying at a Senate National Finance yeah. Committee where I had been turned down on information requests by four government departments. So, so I was a bit moody that morning, and it happens. But what essentially what I, what I meant was that we see government expenditures increasing. And what I had in mind on that day was the size of the public service. It's increasing uh, significantly. So more public servants. Um, the government is also relying more and more on external consultants. Um, think McKinsey, but, but not just McKinsey. There are very good reasons to use consultants, but the use of consultants is expanding to the tune of about $20 billion nowadays. The public service is costing us about $60 billion per year. So that's $80 billion per year, and that's after years of increases. But yet, when... Ordinary Canadians like like me, like my family, like my relatives, friends, and so on, we need government services, passports, EI. Thankfully, I don't need EI, but who knows? With my reports, one day I may need to uh, collect employment insurance. EI, old age security, uh, border crossings. You don't get the level of services that one would expect to be delivered from a growing public service. So, so that's what I meant by that. We have a growing public service, growing use of consultants, but we seem to be witnessing a deterioration in the level of services that Canadians have come to expect naturally from their public service. So, so that's one thing that was on my mind when I made that comment, and it, it's still a concern to me. Well, it's, uh, you certainly wouldn't get any disagreement from the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who waited for passports, you know, who were warned a year in advance that this, you know, that in fact there would be a rush as restrictions were lifted. It wasn't a surprise. I think the layman on the street would have known that. Do you think people are going to travel when they lift restrictions? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and as you say, uh, I think that's what I find disconcerting. I, I can go on, you know, with other lists. I mean, you, you know, you're looking at the federal finances, but if we went provincially, I mean, I think you'd find, again, a consensus that the healthcare system is in real trouble, despite extra money being spent. And as you just said, despite extra money being mm-hmm. spent on federal services, there's just a list of these things, you know, that that are out there uh, that are should be uh, holding people's attention. Um, you know, the other, the other thing you said that day, and I'll take it under advisement, you said you weren't in the best of moods, but this is important, you said. We need to hold the government to account. And you Mm -hmm. said, I can't just do this by myself. 
And by the way, can you enlist me in your army? Because I'm all with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So what I meant by that was I was asked questions by parliamentarians. In that instance, it was senators. And they were like in a bit of a state of shock that I was so candid and blunt. Mm -hmm. and, and they asked, what can we do? I said, well, I can ring the alarm. I can bring this to, to your attention, but I can do that by myself. I have no power. I have no legislative power. Yes. My only power is one of influence. I can raise these issues. I can express my views at the risk of being criticized myself, which, which is happening and is fair game. But I can't do anything by myself. I don't have signing power. I don't have firing power. So it's up to parliamentarians and ministers to do something when they see that they're expanding departments are failing to deliver to the standards that Canadians ex expect. So it's, it's up to ministers and then to parliamentarians to hold the government to account when things are failing. It's, it's in their power to summon senior public servants to House and Senate committees and ask them, what the hell have you been doing for the last two years, the last year you've hired, but services are not improving? Have you hired the right persons? Or have you hired just because you had budgets to hire people and you hired irrespective of what the needs are in your respective departments? So that's the kind of discussions that I'm hoping will be more and more common, um, certainly in Ottawa, but maybe across the country as well, as people get services that are suboptimal, to be polite. Uh, you know, Ala, what you're saying here and related to what you're saying, uh, you know, recently you were talking about the amount of bonuses that were given out. But the, tar the part that you were talking about is that you have a ton of experience in the civil service itself and saying, you know, it's a bit, uh, I'm sorry, this will be my word. You don't have to buy into it, but it's sort of a game. It's easy to set targets that look pretty tough but they're actually not very tough to hit when we find numbers like 98% of uh, people working there got a bonus, you know, and as you said, what was even more shocking is we didn't even make half of those easy targets. Indeed. So um, these targets, the performance indicators and the targets under these performance indicators are set or they're suggested by public servants to ministers. Ministers have a lot on their plate. They have to run departments they have to attend cabinet meetings, they have house duty, and they have to represent their constituents. So they're not very well equipped to challenge public servants who propose performance indicators as well as the targets. So public servants in their right mind, like they're, they're behaving totally rationally. They're proposing targets that seem reasonable and reasonably ambitious, but that in all honesty are not always that ambitious, but still, uh, when we looked at specific departments, they failed to meet close to half of them. But yet, when you look at, as you mentioned, performance pay, that's what their official name is, performance pay or at-risk pay for executives, the vast, vast majority get something. So it doesn't seem to be totally correlated with the performance of departments. And that's a shame. Because I think that would be a good way to incentivize managers to perform at the level that is, I shouldn't say perform, but to deliver services of the quality that Canadians expect and that their, their own ministers also expect. I'm going back a few years, but I can't help but think of one of my favorite examples of what you've just described is the Phoenix Pay System, uh, which uh, former Auditor General, I think Michael Ferguson, you know, God bless him, you know, warned extensively about. And then I think his words were something like, I can't imagine a more, uh, you know, unprofessional approach to that. But my point being only, Alan, what you're saying, uh, the amount of bonuses that were handed out to that group who was in charge of the Phoenix pay system when it was absolute consensus, including from the public sector unions, from politicians, that it had been a disaster. And by the way, continues to be, you know, we continue to pay. For things, I just think when you speak about bonuses, that one's got to be near the top of the Hall of Fame list. That's a, that's a good example. I, I think related to that is the fact that deputy ministers and senior public servants tend to reward effort as opposed to results. So mm -hmm. they see people, uh, for the Phoenix example, I'm sure there are hundreds of people 
including many dozens of executives who worked tirelessly to try to make this system work better. But the results have not been there because of all the things that the former Auditor General mentioned. So instead of re rewarding results, they reward effort, which is not, not, not exactly what, what people want. People want results. So that's, I think, what should be, um, should be rewarded, and um, that's where the emphasis should be put. And there doesn't seem, or again, going back to Michael Ferguson, I remember when he said, this seems like there's a culture that tries to avoid accountability. When I talked to Karen Hogan, uh, she said uh, there was real trouble if you had more than one uh, department involved. You know, nobody took responsibility. So that's another issue uh, just along the lines of what we're saying to get a more effective uh, public sector, but also a better bang for the buck. Because I want to come back to what you said is that we've seen a huge expansion in terms of individuals, but also in pay, uh, you know, during, uh, you know, pandemic years. And I think the frustration for many Canadians is they didn't they didn't feel like they experienced anything near the same thing. The job security, the pay, the benefits. I mean, my gosh, the MPs gave themselves three raises during that period uh, without ever thinking there might be some sort of at least, uh, you know, uh, move uh, to show some leadership and say this isn't the time. You know, and I think that's where the frustration comes. But your emphasis on. What did we get? Can you elaborate a little bit more about this, about the growth in the public sector? And again, uh, you've done, uh, you've looked at things like the growth of consultants, which public sector unions are upset with, saying they're unaccountable. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of numbers here. Um, over the past seven years, personnel spending grew by an average of six point seven percent annually. So that's the overall expenditures on personnel in the public service. Uh, from since 2015 until 2021, the number of FTEs, full-time equivalents, grew by an average of 2.3% annually. So it went from 342,000 to almost 400,000 employees, full-time equivalents. So uh, an increase of 50,000 employees since 2015-16. That's a, a noticeable difference and an increase in the ranks of the civil service. But are you seeing any notable difference in the speed and the quality of services? That's a good question. I, I think many Canadians would say no. Uh, so that, that's a couple of metrics that we highlighted for parliamentarians. And another metric, the compensation per FTE increased at an average of 4% per year. So. That's total compensation, that's salary, but also pension costs and, and also other benefits such as uh, insurance and disability benefits. So everything is going in one direction and it's up, except, well, when it comes to the size and the cost of the public service, but services that Canadians are getting are not always going in that direction. And don't get me wrong, there are people who did wonderful things and worked tirelessly during the pandemic, uh, notably the poor people at the Department of Finance who had to prepare for a budget that was supposed to be tabled in March 2020, and they had to switch gear pretty quickly. The budget was probably ready. Yeah. They had to go into uh, emergency pandemic benefits and uh, ensure that benefits were available for major corporations, for individuals. They had to work on a snapshot, economic snapshot in July a budget later in that year, all the while continuing to brief ministers and the prime minister on the state of the economy, developing new benefits. So there are areas in the public service that are really world-class and should make us proud. But I'm not sure we are, as a country, getting all that great a value from the additions that we have seen in, in the last couple of years. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, just before we leave that last statement, I mean, you did a report on the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, basically saying we get the least bang for the buck in terms of we spend money and what do we get? I mean, we seem to be way below any average or, or uh, a level that we're seeing in other Western countries. Yeah, I would characterize that report that uh, we, we, we released several months ago or a year ago. Yeah as the CRA being average when compared to peers. Okay. And, and peers are in other G7 or G, not G20, but OECD countries, advanced economies, 
that are not always of a similar size, but have parliamentary systems or governance systems and tax systems that are broadly comparable. And on most metrics, on some metrics, we're excellent. CRA is excellent. On some metrics, it's below average. So overall, it's average. So okay. it's, it's unfortunate because there is a lot that I think the, the brains at the CRA, because they are very, very knowledgeable and, and intelligent people, dedicated people, I think they could do much more. But apparently, it's, it's not happening to the extent that it could happen. And I've worked there just before yes. um, coming here, and I've seen the great possibilities and the, the potential for pooling data, different types of data together to do data analytics and uh, business intelligence that could refine, uh, refine collection methods, refine auditing methods. But uh, it seems to be an institution that is advancing cautiously. And, and one could compare that with Revenu Québec, which is, I think, much more aggressive in its recovery of taxes owed. But that's probably the topic for a, yeah. a, different, uh, a different day. And, and, and so may this be, but, uh, but you've done a report recently on immigration and the speeding up immigration. Uh, just a couple of questions about that. Do we have the personnel to handle the numbers of people? I mean, is that one department that's sort of short uh, individuals that could process, let alone the illegal immigrant problem, must also put tremendous pressure on that group? So we looked only at the economic stream. So yes. those who have come here through regular channels, they apply abroad or they are here on visas and they apply lawfully under the Canada Experience class um, or, or, or under the Federal Skill Workers Program. So it's the economic stream purely. And we found that based on data that the department itself, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada gave us, they have now, they have 85%, I think it's 85%, more employees than they need to meet their own service standards, which is to process 80% of applications within six months. So they have significantly more resources than they need to meet these standards. Okay. And that will continue for the foreseeable future. And they should be close to the level they need in about four or five years. So there's enough persons, uh, employees there to process the intake. Uh, we haven't looked at the other streams of, of immigration, the refugees, notably, or family reunification program, in good part because it's difficult for the refugees, much more difficult to predict the flows. Yes. Uh, but that's something that we are considering for the next uh, next round. Uh, let's let's go uh, and move to sort of the things you have to do in a forecasting sense. And, and I'll start with one question because it came out of a December uh, comment report that I think you basically said that Canada ranks are among the worst in concealing federal books from taxpayers. You know, that's, uh, it, it must make your do job imminently harder. Um, it, it makes it difficult. And, and these comments refer to the fact that the public accounts, which is yep. the books at the end of the year, what was the surplus or the deficit for a given year, these books, uh, they're typically released normally September, but in recent years, we've seen that slip to October, November, and then December. So parliamentarians, MPs, senators, they're asked to vote on financing government operations in March okay, and, and April and June uh, for a fiscal year that starts on April 1st. But while they are being asked to vote on hundreds of billions, they still don't know what the government spent and where it spent it for the year that ended in March, they'll find that out only in October, November, or December. So the year is almost over for all intents and purposes. They have approved virtually all of the spending for that year, but they just find out what happened last year. So yeah. that's what I meant by transparency being... Uh, in desperate need of improvement. That and the same goes for the departmental results. So what departments did, what they achieved, their performance indicators, whether or not they met their targets, that's tabled usually several, several months after the mm -hmm. uh, end of the fiscal year. So 
if you're a poor senator or MP, you're asked to vote on billions of dollars for indigenous services, for example, NRCAM. You don't know what they did last year, but you're asked to approve this right now. Billions of dollars in expenditures. So, I, I got a feeling I'm thinking of uh, Auditor General Hogan's comment, though, that she comes across programs where they don't even know where the money is. I, I'm thinking of the Invest Canada program. I'm thinking of uh, the infrastructure where they, she would go and they'd go, oh, well, we don't know where half of that cash is. You know, that makes it even tougher. <laughs> yes, indeed. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do her job. To say no, the least. I, um, let's come uh, continue with the forecasting and that's what you, you do. And there's, uh, let me start with the highlight forecast because people are worried about, uh, debts, uh, the, uh, ongoing increase in debt. Uh, and I'll just let you know, uh, when I heard things like it's affordable, now your office does this, but many don't. And that is you say, here's the assumptions we're making to reach this conclusion. I'm shocked at how many don't. I mean, I'm talking with, with real training, uh, you know, economists at various universities who might be uh, uh, very amenable to a much bigger government. I mean, that's fine. That's their business. But to make assumptions in this world without uh, or make forecasts without assumptions is a dangerous game. How many forecasters said, well, again, I'm sort of all over it because of this last week or the last couple of weeks about the implications of Silicon Valley Bank or, or our banking crisis, or we had the UK pension crisis back in October. I don't think anybody was sitting there, gee, I think the Bank of Canada is going to go, uh, Bank of England is going to throw $65 billion at that. Uh, you know, we're in a world of huge volatility, huge uncertainty. So first of all, forecasting is a difficult game. But in your forecast, you've talked about interest rates, and I thought maybe we'd start with that. Uh, you mm -hmm. said that interest rates on the federal debt would double, which I think is a concern for people because it squeezes out other spending. Yeah, so when we do our forecasts, as you mentioned, we have a series of assumptions. So right now, our assumption is that the Bank of Canada rate will peak or has peaked at 4.5% and, and is slated to decrease gradually from the, either the end of this year or more likely the beginning of next uh, by 25 basis points increments or decrements. So going gradually down to 2.5% and staying there for the foreseeable future. Um, and, and we think that should be enough to bring inflation under control. So the current rate, bring inflation under control so that inflation would return to um, closer to the target than of one to three percent, but of course that's based on the assumption that things don't go south in Ukraine and and Russia. That there's no black swan event. So we saw a Silicon Valley Bank going under. Um, so far, there doesn't seem to be any significant risk of contagion, although Crisis Risk uh, was a bit scary a couple of days ago, but it seems to be under control. So. Yes, there are a series of assumptions, and the same goes when we do our budgetary forecast for the government of Canada and our longer-term uh, financial viability, fiscal sustainability reports, sorry. So when we look at the financial sustainability of governments in Canada, the federal and provincial governments, over a 75-year horizon, we also have to make assumptions. And one mm -hmm. of the big assumptions that we make is status quo policies. So it's not, I know it's not a realistic assumption because no government gets elected just to put things on autopilot and, and, and not implement their own policies, but we have to start somewhere. So when, when we say federal government finances are sustainable over the next 75 years, that's with the caveat under current policies. So it doesn't include more spending on, on national defense to meet NATO targets or more spending on healthcare to respond to provincial demands or the introduction of new programs yeah. that may happen in the future. So that's why, as you say, assumptions are very important and they are to be taken with a huge grain of salt because they're meant to give a snapshot of what would happen if everything stayed the same. So they're directional. More, much more than the definitive point of view of economists, policymakers, or forecasters. 
I, I, as I say, uh, acknowledged right at the front, that's what you guys do and you publish what your assumptions are, which I am mm -hmm. very grateful for. They're valuable then, you know, then we can say, as you said, it's status quo spending, but don't, I know they're promising pharmacare as an, as just one example, as you've just given. Uh, so you have to have a context for that projection. And that's what I'm finding missing though, is any context at all. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking, inflation numbers, economic growth numbers, you know, for example, will there be an economic fallout from what's happened in the banking system in the US? Not necessarily further credit problems, but yeah. will banks be, uh, especially regional, more reluctant to lend for a while anyways, you know, especially in the mortgage market, you know, so yeah. that has an impact. There's just, I guess I'm only pointing out that what, and echoing what you do is that there's a phenomenal number of variables that can be significant, you know, inflation rate, it could be significant. Uh, as I say, I'll have my attention. You mentioned Credit Suisse. I'll be paying attention to Deutsche Bank because it seems like every few years I have to. <laughs> you know, it's, what is it? The eighth largest bank in Europe. If that problem continues, you know, it's a, one of those all bets are off. And I think uh, not at your level, but at the political level, we've been real glib and casual about that. You know, they glom on to some, oh, it's affordable. <laughs> you know, ergo, we can do 50 other things, you know. Uh, I think it speaks to the policy priorities of various governments. The current mm -hmm. government has policy priorities that are more interventionist, that are more towards the spending side. And that's that's a policy choice. That's the government that Canadians have elected. And yes. it's so so it's natural for them to look at the narrative that suits or that confirms uh, their policy inclinations. Let me just back up for one sec, and, and I know your time is valuable. I'm keeping you a little longer than I said, but just, just quickly, what worries you the most looking forward? And it's not necessarily you're predicting it, but it's, uh, you know, like I'm obviously worried about the credit crisis. I'm obviously worried about sovereign debt problems. I'm, er I'm worried about uh, unaffordable entitlements, especially in the U.S. And I don't see any math that makes that work. So, but what worries you in that sort of broader context about the future? Uh, what worries me the most is the lack of attention that's that's accorded to uh, productivity growth. So mm -hmm. we talk a lot about uh, a green economy transition away from fossil fuels. We talk a lot about redistribution, about providing uh, more for those who are in need, about taxing inequalities. But we so we talk about redistributing the pie, but we don't talk a lot as a country about increasing our productivity, our innovation agenda, about making Canada a number one country in the world or close to, to the top five, something like something that would be ambitious, ambitious, sorry, in terms of innovation, economic growth and productivity. Because if we were to be more productive, that would raise everybody's standards of living and that would be a winning strategy. I think, to confront the challenges of tomorrow, including transitioning to a carbon decarbonized economy or transitioning to a greener economy, for example. Uh, but I don't see a lot of attention being placed on that. Uh, and, and I'm not talking just at the federal level. I'm talking in civil society as well. A lot of discussions about reconciliation, diversity and inclusion, which is, I think, necessary for social cohesion, but for longer term economic growth, productivity, innovation, the knowledge economy, it are things that we heard about and we talked about a while ago, but it hasn't been um, at the forefront of the public policy debate in, in a while, I think. And it's certainly reflected in the numbers when you look at productivity growth, for example, as compared to the states, the amount of money uh, you know, on a per capita basis that is vested in the States compared to us. I mean, it's dismal. It's nothing short of dismal. You look at our capital attraction, you know, since 2015, you know, we know that we've had an exodus of capital and not, you know, we do have capital coming in, but not to the degree that sustains our lifestyle or grows our lifestyle. And uh, I think your point is just a wonderful one uh, it, that I wish that would be much higher up in the agenda but maybe I, I won't put words in your mouth, but I suspect I'm always amazed. Not that people don't know economics. They're not interested in it. And I'm talking at the political level. You're not saying that I am. I'm talking at the lack of interest. I mean, we all learn things and we all have to, you know, you know, uh, study it, et cetera. 
But no, there's no interest in it whatsoever that I can discern at this point. But your point is so well taken. If we want to secure our standard of living, which affords our social programs, affords our government, uh, you know, we got to start looking at productivity and capital, uh, capital attraction, you know, simple as that. Look, Eve, that, this is just wonderful stuff. And, and again, I, I, I can't explain enough or uh, state enough how much we appreciate you finding time and the work you're doing. And I want to encourage people to go to the Parliamentary Budget Office website. It's simple. You go there, PBO, and you click on, uh, you know, what they've been writing about, their reports right there. And uh, the amount of information uh, is, is wonderful. The analysis is brilliant and just so much needed to have an informed discussion. So my congratulations to you and your entire office. Thanks for finding time for us. It's a pleasure. It's a, a team, team sport and a team effort. Thank you.